Well, hey, everybody. Happy Monday. Not Monday. It's Thursday. Oh, man. <laughs> I've already started off on a, uh, on a good note. Uh, it is Thursday. Uh, hopefully, y'all are having a great week. Hey, Doc Kami. Welcome. Hope you're having a good week so far. I've already messed up. <laughs> so, hey, Babin. I know, right? I scared myself as well. Uh, it is Thursday. Uh, this is my first time streaming this week because I was at Microsoft Build uh, earlier this week. So, yeah, I'm, I'm still getting my own head on, right? Uh, but, yeah, it's great to uh, great to see y'all. Good to be back online streaming on a Thursday afternoon. i got some fun stuff planned for this afternoon, um, primarily around some edge machine learning stuff with the Google Coral Board that I set up a couple of weeks ago. So... I'm going to shift focus to work on that a little bit more. Uh, and then, yeah, Doc Kami, thank you. And an update on build. So that's what we're going to do. I am going to do start with show and tell. Uh, my show and tell this morning is going to include some hardware, but I'll also spend a little bit of time talking about my impressions of the, the things that were announced in the IoT by the IoT team at build. So um, let's get right into it and talk about that. So first off, on my desk camera, um, I, I've mentioned, I've shown this off a couple of times. This is my little Porta Pi PCB that I'm going to use to build a mobile Raspberry Pi uh, Pi Zero based pen tester. Um, so I ordered a bunch of parts for this on AliExpress, which just takes time. Uh, so I've just continued to get parts in on AliExpress. Every basically 
a few times a week I get another little package in that's got some more stuff. So today or the other day while I was gone this week I got some ZIF connectors for the screen. That'll actually go here on the screen part. Um, I got some, this is actually the little keyboard ICs. What are these things specifically? I need to look at that up close, but that little integrated, that little integrated circuit will actually help control, that goes here on the bottom, and that'll actually help control the keys on the keyboard here. These are the actual keys, so a little surface mount, push buttons, it'll function as the keys on the keyboard, and then a bunch of individual NeoPixels. Uh, and these are actually all together on a board, and I'll just snap off the ones that I need and use those. So that part is pretty exciting, so getting more hardware there. And then the other thing that I wanted to share are some Adafruit buttons. So, and this will actually factor into the project that I'm going to tell about next. I actually got three different sizes of what Adafruit refers to as arcade buttons. There's a 100 millimeter arcade button, 60, 60 millimeter arcade buttons, and then these more classic style 33 millimeter arcade buttons. Um, I'll, I'll, and I got red and green varieties, and you'll see why in just a moment. But these buttons, like these are the classic style, sort of satisfying click kind of buttons. Here, I'll hold it up to the mic. I don't know if y'all can hear that. So I've got those um, in the three different sizes because I'm not entirely certain which one I'm gonna use yet, whether it be the 100, the 60, or the 33. The power requirements are different. These 100, um, these 100 millimeter ones need to run off of 12 volts. So I would need to do some, some buck converters. Hey, RPEG, you should get arcade buttons. Everybody should have these things. Um, but I actually got these in both red and green because we're gonna use them for a project we're gonna start working on today. It'll actually probably dominate the stream for the next next several weeks. So, so you'll notice there's actually an LED in here and then you basically just you know, toss the LED in and then have the button again. I hope y'all can hear that. So they're good looking buttons. I, at, at first glance, I think I'm gonna go with the 60s for the purposes of the project, although these, these hundreds are insane. These are very large. I'm gonna pull that one out too so you can see it close up. So that's what the hundred, that one is a beast. Anyway, um, and I'll talk in a few minutes about what these are for, but these buttons are actually gonna feature in a project that we'll be working on. The hundreds, RP, R, R, is, is it RPEG or RPEG? Um, yeah, they do seem like these are totally game show buttons. Um, and I think that'll, I'll, I'll let y'all help me pick which ones I'm gonna use based on what they're gonna be for. Like JPEG, okay, RPEG, I like it. Well, welcome, hey. Hey James, no worries, you're not that late, just a few minutes. And it is, these buttons are huge, right? So James, I was saying earlier, I have both red and green varieties of these, uh, and we're gonna be using them in a project that we'll work on on the stream over the next several weeks. Because I need these for a demo for Oslo for my uh, talk in Norway next month. So we're gonna end up using one of those. The 100 reminds me of the easy button. .com. Yeah, you're right, it does. I think it, it absolutely does. So before I get back onto talking about and revealing what these buttons are actually for, let's talk very briefly about Microsoft Build. Um, so some of you are aware, if you're not, um, I'll share. I was at Microsoft Build this week in uh, Seattle. Yeah, James, oh yes, I'm going to NDC Oslo. So um, here I'll share info about it. So the NDC Oslo conference is in mid-June, usually every year, and I am giving a talk on, so it comes no surprise considering what I've been talking about a lot lately, I'm giving a talk on Thursday about machine learning and IoT development. So we got some demos to build on the stream 
using this and these buttons will factor in, but it's a really cool place, James. I went last year and uh, it's a really cool conference. Oslo is a beautiful city. Hey, Arpeg, thanks so much for the follow. I appreciate that. Awesome. Glad to have you here hanging out today. Um, so I'm excited about this talk and the weather there, James, that time of year is beautiful. The only thing that really messes with you is the fact that the sun doesn't go down. That time of year, the sun doesn't go down until like 10, 30 or 11 and it comes up at four in the morning. So it's trippy. Let me just say that it's pretty trippy. Anyway, build. Um, so build was Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday. I was there all day Monday, Tuesday. I actually had to come back home yesterday. And um, thanks, James. I appreciate that. I, yeah. Well, if you ever get a chance to go, definitely. And you should uh, see if you can make make the uh, make the conference next year. It's in June. Um, so Microsoft announced a lot of stuff at Build, and it's been a long time for me. This was my first Build since the very first Build when I was a Microsoft employee. So that was like 10 years ago, I think, something along those lines um, in the Windows 8 days. So this is my first Build in a long time, and I was really impressed. I was really impressed with how the conference has changed uh, over time. There's a lot of announcements in the keynote that Satya gave on Monday morning. Um, but the things that I was most paying attention to and most interested in digging into was around the Azure IoT stuff, specifically to hear what the team was going to talk about in the IoT in the IoT realm, not just specifically under the IoT banner, but also edge computing, machine learning, all that kind of stuff as well. And you, if you watched the keynote, and I would recommend watching it if you have a chance because it is a really good two-hour sort of overview of every, literally everything that Microsoft ended up digging into the rest of the conference. Um, Satya talked a lot about this idea of edge, you know, IoT, uh, not IoT specifically, but sort of the importance of hybrid computing, the cloud having a presence on the edge, and there's products that Microsoft has in that space that are really interesting. Uh, so there's a lot of good stuff there. And then yes, as James mentioned, one of the big notable things is they actually announced a new terminal app, like a legit Windows-based terminal app. Uh, and Arpeg, that's a great question. I have no idea what edge computing is. I am, I think that's a, I think I appreciate you sharing that because that's a reminder that all, not a lot of folks do. And honestly, it's a term that has changed, um, not has changed, but it's, it's still a pretty new nascent term. Like a lot of people aren't really certain what it means, but the whole idea is that in a traditional IoT environment, you have microcontrollers that are powering tiny device or like tiny little computers, microcontrollers that are powering machines and devices that are doing data collecting, actuating, what have you. And then you have the cloud. And the cloud is all of the, the servers up in the ether, buried under the ocean, somebody else's data center, what have you. And for the longest time, the dichotomy <clears throat> of computing was that you had these very low power devices that couldn't do a lot other than collect data and send it along in this very high powered cloud. <coughs> and there wasn't really anything in the middle. And the edge, edge computing is the, th is the stuff in the middle. It's the stuff that the, the computers that, <coughs> excuse me, computers and servers and, and boards that are more, <coughs> sorry, I'm getting, I need water. And boards that are a little bit more resilient, that are a little bit more high powered than the microcontrollers, and they can offload some of the work of the cloud. So you can do things in an edge-based computing environment that you can't do on a microcontroller, and that you may not need to, you, you may not want to wait for in the cloud. So machine learning is a good example. Um, like you take image recognition for, or yeah, image recognition, face tracking, whatever it might be. So let's say that you actually have a microcontroller or, or a device that's hooked up to a webcam traditionally and it's streaming video. And when you see someone's face, you want to detect that and take action in the network. Traditionally, what you would have to do is you'd have to stream that video or send images up to the cloud and wait for a machine learning model to come back down or to tell you whether or not there is a face there. So there's delay, there's security concerns, what have you. In an edge computing environment, you could have a board that's connected to that camera that's robust enough to actually do the face tracking 
or the object detection and tell you without, excuse me, without having to go to the cloud, whether or not the, it is actually seeing the things that it wants to see. So I, I feel like I'm not, it's not, I'm not giving it a very elegant description, but RPEG, okay, hopefully, yeah, that does clarify things. So it's the stuff in the middle. Uh, what I shared was just sort of one use case. Um, Fragberg, hey Fragberg, how you doing? If you haven't seen this, it's a priceless vision of uh, Robert Table's view on the new Windows terminal. All right, I'm gonna open this. I trust you. Yeah. <laughs> oh, and that came from Clarkio's chair. That's hilarious. That is hilarious. I like that a lot. Uh, that's good. I do. I do trust you, Frackberg. I think you've earned that. You've earned that by now. Speaking of Clarkio, he was at Build as well. I didn't get a chance to meet up with Clarkio. I did. Uh, I did get to see Fritz, C Sharp Fritz, very briefly, as he was at the um, he was at the um, Progress booth talking to Ed Charbonneau and other uh, other fellow streamers. But I was crazy busy in uh, in sessions and. Um, you know, I did a booth thing on Tuesday where we got to share off, uh, show off some particle hardware, showed off the brew buddy and some other things as well. Um, actually came from someone else. That's just the one you grabbed. Oh, still, that's, that's pretty funny. James, has Clarkio found about the chair profile? Yeah, I think he found out about it in his last stream on Friday. I think somebody told him about it and he was sharing it. He was sharing it on Friday. So yeah. Anyway, back to Microsoft and to Azure. So the keynote was great, but what I really wanted to dig into was, okay, what, what is the Azure IoT stuff that's gonna be talked about at Build? And there were a few uh, really, really great sessions that dug into that. One was from Sam George, who leads the Azure IoT team. I believe he works for Scott Guthrie. Guthrie did a deep dive demo as well after some of Sacha's keynote stuff, and that was cool. There was a VS code, there's a VS, there's a, a live share demo between Scott Hanselman and Amanda Silver across both Visual Studio and Visual Studio Code. That was pretty cool. So some great developer tools and features. There's a new terminal. But the IoT stuff was really cool. And I did not expect to be as impressed as I was for a couple of reasons. I Some of the announcements came out early last week and I was sort of underwhelmed, especially around this thing called IoT Plug and Play. IoT plug and play was actually announced last week and I thought, okay, well, this is just a marketing term to try to tell me that like, oh, it'll work just like plug and play did on Windows back in the 90s, right? Uh, and that was the analogy that the Microsoft team continued to use. But as they dug into it, I actually got it. I, I understood it a lot more. Um, and so really there were two big things that I walked away with on the IoT side. One was Azure IoT Central is now way cheaper and is now worth actually looking at. Um, if you've watched this stream in the past, you know that I've done some stuff with Azure IoT Hub and Electric I.O. Azure IoT Hub's been around for a while, but it's really nothing more than just a, it's a bus. It's a dumb repository for data that gets streamed into Azure. It doesn't really get any value until you do something else with it. So you can put data in Electric I.O. You can pipe data through streaming analytics into a Power BI if you want to do dashboarding that way. IoT Central actually solves that by being an actual SaaS product on top of IoT Hub for the first time. And this is actually really cool. So IoT Central apps, and then you refresh. An IoT Central app actually gives you an, a URL, a publicly accessible URL that you can use um, and customize and white label. White labeling was actually one of the features that was announced last week. And .com, you're revisiting as well, yeah. This is the first time for me because I hadn't used it before because I think it was like 500 bucks just to try it out. Um, and there now is more of a freemium version of IoT Central. But what's cool about IoT Central is that it solves that need that people getting data in IoT Hub had previously, which is, okay, well, I've got a connection to Azure, that's great, but what can I actually do with it now? Like, how can I actually take a look at analytics? I wanna create dashboards, so show me something show me something that's actually streaming from my device. And so when you set up an IoT Central app, now it actually has some default templates in there with some simulated data. So you can actually get to see like, okay, now I can get a view of exactly what's going on um, to see what sort of telemetry devices are collecting. You can actually 
you know, pick and choose the data that's showing up in graphics and things like that. Um, you can create device templates. So one of the Azure IoT Central template ships with support for the MX chip, Raspberry Pi, and Windows IoT Core. Um, and I believe the core is what runs on the Azure Sphere devices. You can also run it on a Raspberry Pi. And so you get sort of simulated versions of all of these devices that you can inspect and see and, you know, sort of get a get more of a view of what Azure IoT Central actually looks like. Um, but what's cool is that with these devices, there's a concept of measurements and properties and commands where you can actually call functions back on devices. Hey, Epicheros, how you doing? Happy Thursday. Hope you're having a good week so far. Thanks for coming in. I am right now just sort of recapping some of my impressions from Build this week. Just got back yesterday. And all of these, um, you know, all of these different device types are, are really, uh, I think this is actually really useful to be able to define things in this way. A lot of these things are things that were possible before, but IoT Hub didn't really give you much, by the way, of guidance to create dashboards or to create device templates and things like that. So there's a whole lot more in here now where you can actually create sets of devices that can be managed together. Um, you can actually create, so for example, this device here is a, I'm trying to find the right place for this. If I look at my device explorer, um, the, you can actually create real or simulated devices. So in this case, I, if I have an MX chip that's a simulated device. So you have the ability to create devices that uh, you, if you don't have a physical device, you can still do something with it to simulate analytics and testing and commands and all those kinds of things, which is a really powerful. You can also create real equivalents of devices. So like I'm going to come in here and add my, my MX chip. Um, should be kind of cool. Let's play with that. Uh, and then there's more. There's even more stuff that was announced the other day that's not in here yet, but that will be coming relatively soon. So you have the ability to set up rules to actually take action based on devices. And I'll, I'll put this blog post in here because this is um, an interesting, this is from Peter Provost who he actually did one of the talks on Tuesday morning that I went to where they dug into this a lot more. So you can actually, you know, add personalizations. You can now white label, um, you know, white label the portal. So you can actually make it look like your company uh, IoT Central app, which is kind of nice. So sort of own internal dashboards. They did some demos on the keynote stage with uh, Starbucks. If you watch the keynote, the Starbucks demo was using IoT Central and it was sort of their white labeled version of IoT Central. Yeah, dot com, it is cleaner and much more succinct. So I'm excited to work on to use this more. I'm going to use this for the demo that I'm going to be building for Oslo over the next several weeks. So it should actually be a lot of fun. But then the other piece that was really interesting to me is this concept of IoT plug and play. Um, and I mentioned that Microsoft announced plug and play late last week and I read it and I'm like, well, that's not like, okay, plug and play you want to do for IOT, like what you did for, you know, Windows drivers and peripherals back in the 90s. Like, eh, I don't really know if it's the same thing. And while it's not the same thing, it is to me more than just a lifting of a marketing term and putting it in the IOT space. It actually really is interesting. And the reason, the rationale that the team used to describe this, hopefully y'all are finding this interesting. Tell me if you're not. Um, the rationale that the Microsoft team used to describe this is that all of the work that Microsoft has done in the Azure IoT side so far has sort of taken you from when you get your data into IoT Hub forward. So it's really been focused on what are we giving you to take the data you've got to create charts and graphs and visualizations and alerts and get into databases. But what they have not done to date is solved some of the stickier problems in embedded development of connecting sensors, getting telemetry data in, um, you know, exposing function calls. If y'all remember the streams where I spent several days trying to get, I trying to get my particle, um, my brew buddy project to not only publish messages to IoT Hub, but to actually send messages back from electric IO back onto the device, all that stuff with MQTT and TLS and that, that big headache, like that's the stuff that Microsoft really hadn't done much in the past to try to solve. And what plug and play is designed to do is take that piece of it away to where as an embedded developer, I can buy a product, whether it's a microcontroller or a sensor, and then that sensor has, has metadata that comes with it 
that describes to Azure IoT what my device is capable of. So what metrics, it, what telemetry values it can send along, what functions, can, what commands can be called on the device, who the manufacturer is, all of that kind of stuff. And so, yeah, the cloud to device problem. And so the, what that ends up looking like, and if you go at any of these, for instance, if you go to catalog.azureiotsolutions.com, which is the sort of rebuilt site that Microsoft released on Tuesday around this, um, you can see now that there are sensors listed in this catalog from certain manufacturers that are listed as sort of IoT plug and play compatible. And so when I either buy one of those devices or include it, um, and this, this, all of this functionality is not quite yet in Azure IoT Central, it's still coming. Um, oh, dot com, are you having a big stream delay today? I'm, let me look at, I'm not getting anything on the inspector. Sorry to hear that. Yeah, RPEG, I, this is what I thought about it too. Like, what's cool about this is now we actually have this thing, there's some, there's some power to this. Not only can I know now that here's a sensor that I can buy that solves my problem and it has some sort of built-in Microsoft support, um, but you also, you also have the ability to plug it right into Azure IoT Central. And so I can't, I don't have everything where I can demo this today, but I want to mess with it and, and work on it a little bit more because the whole idea and what's valuable about this is that when I add a new device, like today, if I added another MX chip to my Azure IoT Central app, um, I have to go in and add these measurements. I have to manually specify all the telemetry values. But with IoT plug and play, when I pull in a new device, and right now you won't see this, but if I go into device templates and I create a new template and I'll have the ability to like, there will be a, an option here for me to actually upload a metadata file that describes the device, um, that it will automatically have the sensors and the actuators. And the reason why this works, this is what I'm getting to, is um, because IoT plug and play has defined something new called the Digital Twin Definition Language or DTDL which is a JSON LD based schema. And I highly recommend, this is on my, I've started reading this, I highly recommend reading this and I'll get back to chat in just a few moments. Um, that describes this definition language. And the whole point of this definition language is to say, is to, is to define a capability model for IoT devices. To say, this is what this device is capable of, this is its interface, this is the telemetry that it collects, this is the commands that it can take. These are the different kinds of objects that it can work with. And by using this language, you can create a JSON file that can be sucked into Azure IoT Central and then mapped directly to your device. So for instance, if I go back to the seed temperature humidity sensor, you'll notice that the, down, the JSON file for their capability model is already in here. And this is what that looks like. Let me zoom in a little bit. This is the DTDL file for that seed studio capabilities for that uh, that seed studio device it has specifically it says it uses the capability model context it's an air temperature and humidity sensor node has an id these are all these are my interfaces it implements device information interface it implements these interfaces etc cetera, etc cetera. Um, there's others in here so for instance let me let me get one that actually ha may have some commands on it as well oh no uh, how about this, the mobile, there we go, the Vision via mobile device. So if I look at its device capabilities, I may see something a little bit different. It implements a device, a drive recorder interface. It may implement, um, oh, here we go. Here's some telemetry. So here's GPS location. It also takes this command where you can actually tell it to start streaming or stop streaming. That's what all of these things basically tell, not only the device, it's the device manufacturer basically providing a contract and saying, this is my contract that describes what my device is capable of, what it gives you and what it can receive. And then Microsoft through IoT Central, what you'll have the ability to do then is actually when you create a new device, suck that in through that file and all of that telemetry stuff and all those commands will be automatically populated in IoT Central. So you don't have to do that uh, on your own. 
The other advantage that this has, and this is, I think, an underrated piece of it, is that through these interfaces, you will also be able to use IoT Central's, the IoT Hub VS Code extensions to stub out the C code needed to implement these interfaces. And that is really stinking cool. So that you would have the ability to say, here's how to receive this command that's in the interface. Here's how to send this telemetry that's in the interface. And that is all packaged up automatically um, by IoT Central. And, and, but because this is an open standard, because the digital twin definition language is by, by nature is meant to be open source and open, others can contribute to it. Uh, and I think, yeah, I think this is amazing. So, all right, it's dot com. Let's go back. Dot com. What is this? I'm going to click on the URL because I trust you as well. Um, oh, the Azure kit. Oh, is it the ESP32 Azure kit? I don't know, but I'm going to have to buy one now. Get out of Taobao. Um, so, I have to look at that. That's an interesting one, not common. I don't know. Siva, is IoT plug and play available? Hey Siva, how you doing? Is IoT plug and play available in certified devices? Can we add custom definitions of our own devices? Yes, Siva, that's an awesome question and you can. So you would be able to actually create your own definitions even if they're not ever shared with anybody. So if you're building them for your company and it's only for your clients, you can still create those DTDL files and use those and just store them either locally or store them in your own repository so they don't have to be public. From the particle standpoint, this is really cool because I think what I would like for particle to do is, um, I and I'm, I think I'm just gonna start this as an open source project, so hopefully we can do, maybe that's something else we can do together, uh, is actually generate the DTDL for particle projects based on your particle variables and functions, right? The variables are your telemetry, the functions could be your commands, and it can just automatically generate the DTDL based on your device. And then you can suck that into central. So that'd be a cool thing to work on. Um, Doc Kami, I know for a fact, I think you'd probably be interested in that. So maybe that's something that we can we can collaborate on uh, and mess with a little bit. That would be kind of neat. Um, now, hey, Ryan Asaurus Rex, how you doing, Ryan? Good to hear from you. I know you mentioned last week, this is your first, first time not going to build in a while. It was a good one though. I, I, I really enjoyed it. Um, Few minutes late, so basically this is a store with IoT devices that come with a contract that I, Azure IoT is looking for. Yeah, absolutely. So once I finally understood this, I mentioned earlier that I felt like plug and play seemed like a marketing term, but once I understood all that context that I just shared, hopefully I, I explained it well, um, it made sense to me. Plug and play actually is a perfect analogy for this because I think that's exactly what Microsoft's trying to achieve on the sensor side of really allowing these things to plug in really cleanly together. Uh, and Siva, good question. Is the code generation only for C? That was all that was demoed, uh, but I don't know for a fact. I, I, I would be willing to guess that code generation could be extended to other languages, um, but their primary focus right now is on creating the C-based interfaces, at least in what they showed off. And Ryan, he had the same question, is Node C, C Sharp supported? I can't, I can't imagine that it wouldn't be. Everything that Microsoft has done in the Azure space has been very multi-language in terms of support, so I would think that they would do that as well. Um, yeah, yeah, yeah. Doc Kami, so here's that 80, oh, the ESP32 the ESP Azure Dev Kit on Mauser. You know, it's funny, now that you mentioned this, I do remember seeing this. Can you tell on Mauser when it was released? And dot commie, man, you costed me money. Every time you send me a link to something I can buy, copyright 2018. This is, okay, so this is their hardware design guide. So it has, ah, so this is why it's interesting because it comes with a built-in screen, light, magnometer, temperature and humidity, barometer, motion sensor, micro SD support. Yeah, okay. It's an interesting device, and its capabilities would probably be very similar. So let's actually take a look here. So commands that would be supported. Send message to device. Yep, that makes sense. What else? Telemetry, pitch, get the current pitch. Telemetry, roll, pressure, 
altitude, magnometer X, Y, and Z. Start the fan, stop the fan, fan speed, temp threshold, temp, humidity, ambient light. The published date on the Microsoft site was December of this year, December of 2019. It's a device, dev kit from the future. Board manufacturer. This is interesting. Anyway, so I know we're looking at Jason schemas, um, but I think this is all, I think this is really cool. I was really impressed with these announcements. Um, as you saw, I mean, as we're looking through the registry, Microsoft launched with a bunch of different partners. They actually did a demo using an ASCII dash cam, um, which was really cool. So there's definitely a lot of great stuff in there. And I think the, the big step, some of this stuff isn't coming until the summer. Um, oh yeah, here, there's actually an episode on the, on channel nine, I think, <coughs> excuse me. On the IOT show, there was a definition of IOT plug and play, and this just came out the other day. So y'all definitely watch that. I'm going to save that to watch as well. Um, how long is that episode? One of the common problems IoT developers Oh yeah, 12 minutes. Yeah. So, worth checking out. Um, and we'll see, you know, we'll see a lot of the stuff sort of start to pipe in over the course of the next, uh, next couple of months. Their extension marketplace today, I think IoT Hub and IoT Edge are the only things that are still there. Oh, the IoT Hub Toolkit. I think I already have that one. Um... Not IoT device workbench, that's a different thing. But so I do believe it'll be the IoT hub toolkit that gets updated to have all this stuff in the future, in the very near future. So that'll be kind of neat. All right, so we covered, that was show and tell. And you know, I finally gave myself 15 minutes for it and it took close to 30 instead, but hey, that's all right. Um, I did want to make one announcement really quick that my streaming schedule is actually going to change and hopefully this is the last time that I do this for a while but starting starting next week I'm actually going to drop I'm gonna I'm not gonna stream on Thursdays anymore um, there's a number of reasons for that there's other streamers that I want to watch and participate in uh, what they're doing and also I have a ton on my plate over the next couple of months and streaming twice a week is becoming a bit too much to be honest, what I am going to do instead is on Mondays, I'm going to stream for three hours instead of two. So hopefully that's a decent enough compromise. We can hang out for a little bit longer together on Mondays. <clears throat> so my Monday stream times will be the same noon to three instead of noon to two. Ah, uh, Fragberg, James, I'm sorry. I'm sorry, guys. Um, and, and I may be able to get back to that, but frankly, at this point, it has been... Um, it's been tough because another thing that I want to do is I want to start doing more stuff on the particle I, on the particle Twitch channel. So I guess one another way to look at this is by me dropping Thursdays there will there will be more content on the particle IoT Twitch channel. Uh, Fragberg, I forbid it. <laughs> all right, all right, never mind. Never. <laughs> uh, Ryan, yeah, it is a lot of work, and uh, and Frank, you're right. It's hard to find a stable schedule for sure. Definitely. Um, hey, Bold Big Flank, howdy, how are you? I hope you're having a great day and a great week. Uh, .com me, no, don't listen to James, I'm not retiring. Uh, I am, however, changing my streaming schedule to where I'm gonna start, I'm gonna scale back to only streaming once a week for a little while. Uh, I'm gonna stream on Mondays from 12 to three instead of Mondays from 12 to two and Thursdays from two to four. So I'm gonna stop doing the Thursday stream for a little while. I will be with y'all on other streams like the Michael Jolly and and uh, Robert Tables in particular because I know they we overlap together on Thursdays. Um, I have a ton on my plate over the next couple of months, and so this is really a, a sanity thing, but also making sure that when we come together once a week, that it's a good time, a good productive time. So hopefully y'all forgive me for that change. Good, Doc Comey. <laughs> Fragberg is not happy about it, Doc Comey. Um, 
Fragberg, as I get closer to starting the stream myself, and you should, I find it difficult to find a time that isn't overlapping with someone else and convenient for me. Which is, I suppose, a good problem to have. I mean, we definitely, there's definitely always a good option for somebody's stream to go and hang out on. Um, and I know that can be tough. And frankly, I could keep going Tuesday, thir and, and, you know, on Thursdays and have that overlap with the folks that are there. That's not the primary reason. I think the bigger thing is just making sure that, A, that I do the best streams I can when I'm streaming, uh, and then also leaving time for the other parts of my day job because there is a ton of other stuff I've got on my plate in the next couple of months, including the project that I'm about to move to. Um, so we have done a lot on this channel over the last couple of months, but I am very excited to share this. My latest project, what we're going to be working on for a little while here is what I am calling Emotion Mesh. Um, so this is a project that I'm working on for the, uh, for my NDC Oslo demo. Um, it's a project that I'm going to be working on. I'm actually giving a talk. I think I'm giving this talk now three times I've scheduled between now and the end of the year. So in Oslo, in the Dominican Republic in October, and then potentially again in November. Um, let me check ketchup on. Uh, da, 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 da. Fragberg is happy in his natural state, whining loudly. It's all right, Fragberg. I hear you. James saying, being, being in the UK, these streams filled. Oh, James, I bet they filled your evenings. That's for sure. That for sure is, yeah, tease, that's right. Well, so this this actually ought to be fun. Bold big flank, today I bought I bought an electron and a thermal printer. I'm going to make a system that lets me send love notes to my wife while she's out of town. That, yeah, bold big flank, that is awesome. I love that. Please tell me that you're gonna write that up and share it. I will I will reshare that with everyone. That's, that is an awesome idea. Do it. You have, and if I can help, message me. Send me a direct message or whisper on Twitch or whatever it is that people do. I would love to see that. Very, very neat. So this is a sketch that I did yesterday on the plane, on my iPad on the plane on the way home from um, from Build. And the whole impetus of this project is what I want to show off is how you can pair microcontrollers like particle devices with um, more robust single board computers that are used for edge machine learning. So if you've watched this stream the last couple of months, you know I have a Google Coral that I've used. I spent some time messing with it, setting it up. Um, that is gonna be the brains of this project. So what I'm effectively going to do is I'm going to build a, um, I'm gonna build a project that has a webcam that does face tracking and then emotion detection. So when you walk up to the camera, you smile or frown or make an angry face. And the Google Coral will actually use a, a remotely trained model, a previously trained model, to perform inf inference on the image that comes up and then show on, and then basically show you whether or not it, what emotion it is it thinks you're making, whether you're happy, sad, angry, conflicted, whatever it might be show your emotion on the screen here, sort of a live view and then your emotion. And then the particle pieces of that will be that there will be this box that has the coral in it, but that will be UART connected to an argon. And the argon will be used to actually start the demo, to actually take a picture. And then when it shows you the result, what it thinks your emotion is, these buttons will light up. And for those of you that may have come late, um, the buttons will look kind of like this. I haven't decided what size I'm gonna do yet, but the buttons that will be in the top of the box will be one of these, a red one and a green one. Um, and those, and you will hit whether or not the model is right or wrong, right? So you'll hit the green button if the model is right. It is a big button for, for I think I may go with the medium one, honestly. Or if it's wrong, you hit wrong. And the screen will show stats on the, uh, the amount of time that the demo is right, etc., all that kind of stuff. Um, and in addition, We'll have some xenons here that are connected in a few different ways. I'll have one xenon that's connected to an ultrasonic distance sensor. So when you actually trip the distance sensor, it'll activate the demo, right? So these buttons will light up and you'll get to start it. And then, of course, I'm going to have NeoPixels in this. Hey, Bold Big Flank, thanks so much for the follow. I appreciate that. That's awesome. Appreciate it very much. Thanks again for coming and hanging out and for sharing your, your project and your ideas. Definitely. 
Um, so I will have three or four NeoPixel strips, of course, wired up here, and those will run some attract animations when the demo is idle, or a processing animation when the when the coral is interpreting its results, running inference against your photo, uh, and then red or green based on the result, right? Uh, and this will all be hooked up into a mesh network so that these things will be connected. The coral will run basically just the, um, the coral will run only the inference stuff. It's not gonna be cloud connected. Um, what I am gonna do, however, is have live stats on the screen that come from the corals. Because I, I want to show this, like how accurate will this remote model be? This completely disconnected from the cloud machine learning model. And then how would that compare to something maybe up in Azure uh, machine learning services? So what I'm going to do as well is create a duplicate version of this model that will be up in Azure ML. And it will also get a snapshot of the image and will perform the same inference and will check speed, latency, and then we'll also check accuracy. So we'll have sort of a way of showing like how fast is this machine, how fast is Edge ML really, and how accurate is it? Uh, and then, you know, just see where it goes. So that's the project we're gonna work on over the course, starting today, really, uh, over the course of the next month or so. Uh, Fragberg, I've regressed to a four-year-old. Hey, I know, it's all right. You're welcome. Your four-year-old self is welcome here, Frackberg. And then Frank, expect people to smash much harder the bigger the button. You know, that's a really good point, Frank. I probably should think very carefully about, maybe if I go with the middle one, people will just sort of lightly press it. As a, and this, this one just feels too small to me. Although I could use this one as the start button for the demo itself. And then the red and green buttons here for whether or not you're right, whether the model's right or wrong. You know? Live to see. Siva asks, have you tried Chirp for the, the Chirp Audio Transmission SDK? I have not. I know that that's something that Michael Jolly uh, is interested in using for his uh, planter project. So I have not yet, but I know I need to. I need to actually mess with that pretty soon. And how secure, and I don't know how secure or reliable it is, Siva, because I don't know what the transmission protocol is. Hey, Joe. Hope you're having a good day. Thanks for jumping in. <clears throat> We're talking about the next particle project that I am starting today and sort of the, this hand-drawn illustration of it. So that's the idea. So there's gonna be a box, a box that will sit on, the, on a table at the conference where this will be the demo. Inside the box will be an argon that'll be the gateway of a mesh network. It'll be connected via UART to a Google Coral Edge TPU board which will be connected to a USB camera and a monitor. The USB camera will take a shot of your face, making some sort of emotion, like smiling. I always get self-conscious when I smile. Smile, and then it'll perform inference on the board to say what your emotion was, what it thinks it was. Um, particle devices will interact with the demo through lights and triggering with ultrasonic distance sensors and all that good stuff. Yeah, that's the plan. So, um, it is almost, see, it's almost bio break time, but I do want to get into this. So, given all that, and I wanted to introduce the demo, there's a few things that we're going to do. Fragberg, as my wife puts it, I look like I'm in pain when I smile. Okay, Fragberg, so this is going to be the first distraction of the day, of course. Because anytime anybody says that, or I say that I can't smile, then this is going to be going old school. Y'all remember that scene in Friends where Chandler tries to smile? Like Chandler and Monica are getting wedding photos taken, or their engagement photos taken. And Chandler tries to smile. That's great, Monica. Great. Now, Chandler, you want to give us a smile? Okay. <laughs> I'm sorry, is the seat uncomfortable? No, I am. <laughs> I know you can do this, okay? You have a beautiful smile. I do? Yeah. <laughs> this looks so old now. Maybe you don't have to smile. Let's try something else. Let's try, um, try looking sexy. Okay. Okay. <laughs> 
I'm going to stop it there. But yes, Frackberg, that's exactly. Yeah, Joe, definitely. Um, I, uh, I'm excited to work on this. It should be good. It should be good. We'll do this. The, Joe, this is the demo that I want to have not only for next month, but also at that conference in August up in Wisconsin. So we'll definitely have it there as well. And yeah, Frackberg, that was, that's my thought every time. Okay, so there's a couple of things that I want to do now. Um, I have, let me go back to my desk to the big camera because y'all remember this is the coral dev board um, that's going to sort of function as the brains for this ml project um, it is online it's ready to go and um gotta see some twitch friends in wisconsin this summer heck yeah um, so this is, is wired up, it's ready to go, but there's actually a couple of things that I want to talk about. So, hey, Cooper Clay, just resub for two months. Thanks. Thanks, Clay. That's awesome. I appreciate that. And actually, the camera did go to fire, by the way. So the camera did go to fire mode. So that old thing that we were fighting with before. Hey, Clay, thanks so much, man. I appreciate that. Welcome back. That's very cool of you. And then I have a JavaScript error with object object. <laughs> oh, Cyan Panda Bot, you don't know anything. You're wrong. I'm not messing with the bot today. I'll fix it later. So I don't know if y'all remember, but last was it last week that Microsoft, yeah, that the Visual Studio Code team actually announced remote development extensions for uh, Docker and for Windows subsystem on Linux, and then also for SSH. So what I actually thought I would do today is actually configure the new remote dev stuff so that we can program against the Coral dev board without me having to basically SCP files back and forth uh, or to use or, or to use Vim, because I want to do that. So I'm excited to do that. Oh, cool, Ryan, great. So, cause that, so I wanted to wait to do that to where we could actually do it here um, it, you have to have VS Code Insiders, which I do. Um, it's right now only available on Insiders, but that's okay. Once you've got Insiders, um, it, it seems like it'll be relatively easy to set up. I already have the extension installed. So let me actually... Uh, so we're gonna get this set up. Hopefully this will be relatively quick and then we will get to it. So. All right, and then I'm gonna take a quick bio break and then we'll come back on. Yeah, so Robert Table set this up with Docker and it was pretty slick. I, I, I had him on, I was, I was in lurk mode, but I had it on mute and I saw that he did that. So I wanted to try to do the same thing with this SS8, with this, uh, this Coral board, because this is basically just like a Ubuntu board uh, with a similar thing. And VSC Insiders is available on at least Fedora Linux. So that's cool. So it's, it's all over the place, that's good. So I have the extension. And so what I'm going to do now is I'm going to do remote SSH connect to host. Uh, and my host is Mendel at, hold on. Da, 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 da. Mendel at 192.10.216. Can't unreach it. Why? Hold on. What? Maybe I have to like configure the host. Maybe I have to like configure SSH host first. Hmm. Or maybe what I have to do is actually just do the 192, 168, right? .10.216 and not do the Fragberg, are you are you judging? Are you judging my IP addresses? All right, so I'm I'm thinking that's a, okay. Well, that's fine. You can judge away, sir. You can judge away. Uh, okay. Well, I don't have y'all see this. Let me move my move the window. Oops. Hold on. 
I'm sure that Clay is judging my IP address choices as well, so. Bah, 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 bah. Here, there, y'all can see what's actually going on. I'm on the server. So I'm guessing this is a good sign, confirming that it is reachable. I mean, you would think I would get a little bit more status info here from that. So, because what's supposed to happen at this point is VS Code will connect to the server and set itself up. VS Code will keep you up to date using a progress notification, and you can see a detailed log in the remote SSH output channel. Okay, let's do that. Um, output. How do you open up the terminal? Open. Output. Oh, there we go. Oh, it's over here waiting for my password. Oh, maybe that's what the problem is. Hold on. See, but that's not what I want to do. So, cancel. I had an elaborate subnet set up for all my devices. It all went to hell when I figured out I could use host names, so I should probably shut up. Ah, uh, that's all right. With the exception that my kids and IoT stuff is in its own segregated area, I do need an IoT devices subnet. I think we've talked about this on the stream before. That is something that I absolutely know that I need to do. Um, user at host. Mendel at. Okay, what? so that is right. Hold on. Not Minoa. Oh, SSH. Uh, SSH, SSH Mendel. This is what I want. Did I fat finger it before? Did I do it wrong? It's not Linux x86? Wait, what? Oh, that's a bummer. Does it not work for... Is there a... Terminal command for architecture. The terminal command to figure out the architecture of your machine. You name, oh yeah, you name A. It is Arc 64. Is it? Uh, thanks, thanks guys, you name A, okay. Oh, it needs to be uh, not Linux x86-64. So is this an issue because it's ARM64? Y'all tell me because this is a little bit out of my depth. I'm assuming that this is telling me it's Linux Arch 64, so it's not gonna work on ARM. Bummer. FAQ. Maybe DOA on this. That's okay. We can still do... Um, there's still stuff we could do. Yeah. Yeah, I guess not. Unreachable or not, x86. Yeah, it looks like an ARM issue to me too. Um, 
Yeah, Clay, I know that Vim is fine. I just... I... I like VS Code. I just... I like doing stuff in VS Code. It's just really nice and easy and useful, you know? But we can work around it. We can manage. I'm going to take a bio break, like a two-minute bio break really quick, and then we're going to go back. We're actually going to just do, do some development. We'll just use Vim. <sighs> we'll manage. Quick bio break. Y'all give me two minutes. Be right back. I was hoping that somebody was going to make the lights chase. Thank you, Doc Kami. Get that working. Ah, Fragberg. All right. Um, he's already gone, I'm sure. But yeah, we'll see him again. We'll probably raid Robert Tables here when we are done. James, you're literally in Vim at the moment. All right, I'll suck it up. I'll suck it up. You know, but the reason why I wanted to do this was because I really, really have been happy with using because we're gonna end up doing some Python development inside, um, to basically to build these models against the Coral dev board. And I've really been liking the Python experience inside of Visual Studio right now. Um, so I've been messing with this. This is just an example. But one of the things that I was doing to learn TensorFlow and Keras was um, basically doing this quick test against the MNIST dataset. The MNIST dataset is a data set of hand-drawn numbers, and the machine learning problem here is actually creating a, um, a neural network to be able to detect the, the hand-drawn numbers. And it's actually pretty neat, so you can get debugging inside of here, which is really neat, um, but also just run these. You know, there's a whole lot of good IntelliSense. You can actually run the Python files directly from the terminal. Um, this will actually go through and load the MNIST data set. It'll train the model. Them 80s vibes. Uh, yeah. 
I got the 80s vibes in my editor theme, and I got 80s vibes in the chip tune station. Um, but so you'll actually go through, you go through the process of training the model. So each time it goes through, you can see the accuracy. It goes from like the mid 90s up to the high 90s uh, as it goes through. And then it does an evaluation at the end, which is kind of neat. Ooh, a feature request. So I just noticed this for VS Code Remote. So while that's doing that, let's actually, go, let's add a feature request. Um, because it would be really nice. I'm assuming this is GitHub. So let me see if somebody's actually, you know, I, I wonder if somebody has actually added support for this. Please add support for Linux on ARM64. There you go. Please add support for ARM on Raspberry, on Raspberry Pi. All right. Thumbs up on that one. This is a person that's looking for NVIDIA Jetson. SSHFS work regardless of architecture. Oh really, what's SSHFS? Well, that may have solved my problem. James, really need to get my head around this stuff. Just started working through programming intelligence from O'Reilly. Oh, programming collective intelligence. Uh, is that a good one? I might have to get that one. Oh, cool. So the one that I highly recommend is called Grokking Deep Learning. Uh, this is a really good book. I highly, I highly recommend this one. I've been reading through this one. And this actually gives you sort of like a framework free way of doing, uh, of understanding deep learning, machine learning. So you don't start with Keras or Scikit or anything like that. You basically just use NumPy and just do some stuff you know, basic stuff on your own, which is really cool. James, it's not really AI type stuff, I don't think, but more of methods of, rec oh, like building recommendation engines. That's still really cool though. I like that. Okay. So, so this is actually what runs through that. It actually runs through five epics, which is repeating the data set over and over again to try to, um, James, is it dumb friendly? Absolutely. I mean, I'm reading it. It absolutely is. It starts from like pure scratch. I think you would really like it. Um, yeah, it's really good in that regard. So it, I went through five epics and I got from 93% all the way up to 98% and then ran a sample of 10,000 to do the test and got 98% recognition. So it's kind of a neat way to learn the Keras and TensorFlow uh, approach. And I've been doing a lot of this kind of stuff, so I, but I like this. I really like having Visual Studio support for this. So here's somebody that actually mentioned, let's see, they mentioned another comment. Babin, oh cool, awesome. I look forward to hearing what you think about it. Arm, save, not specify, da 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 da. Yeah, see, this is this person had the same thought that I did. Like, G, dealing with GPIO stuff through VS Code would be amazing. This would be great, especially like debugging and all right. So the request has been made on a couple of different occasions, but no one has yet no one has yet committed to it. However, if you notice, it is the highest. Yeah, James, a lot of the guides and resources throw, start throwing terminology. And I totally agree. Like, I'm watching a Udacity course on machine learning right now, and it's a similar thing. Like, it's good, but they do start, they throw a lot of stuff at you really, really quickly. So um, this one, this one is written by someone that actually has only gotten into machine learning in the last five or six years. So it's not written from an academic perspective. It very much is a, hey, 
I had to, you know, I, I had to figure it out, learn myself. Here's how I, here's how I can help you. So this is a very highly rated request. I think that's a good thing. But what did the person mention in the other one? That there's an extension called SSHFS. SSHFS. Oh, really? I mean, that wouldn't give you, so the advantage of, of Visual Studio, the remote desktop, the remote console, is that it actually runs an emulated version of Visual Studio code. So you can do things like debugging and have extensions that are only installed on the remote instance and not on your local instance. This just gives me the ability to mount a remote folder, but that's still pretty good. I mean, this is actually still kind of what I would like to have. Um, so failing having the remote support, I will take this. So I'm going to, I'm going to add that to my stream notes instead. Um, using SSHFS instead as VS code remote doesn't support arm yet. It's not been released there yet. James, I think there's an online version. So if you go to the author's website, Grokking Deep Learning, I think you can get the ebook. Let me see if I can find the book site. Or even the, here, even the GitHub repo. Here we go. There, you get all the text and resources for free. In fact, I need to like clone this repo. Yeah, very cool. Um, here, let me make a note of that. Going back to earlier, use the medium arcade button. All right. Uh, Making out to myself the link to the GitHub issues for this later on. But it looks like SSHFS will actually is, is, is the recipe for what we need. So if I create a new, or I open a new window, and then I do SSH. Connect as workspace folder, see what that'll do. Hmm, what is it asking me for? Dot commie suggests a large button. Okay, okay, hold on. Dot commie Your vote counts for a lot, dot commie, so that may sway me. That may sway me. Um, all right, so in enabled. Let me take a look at this extension. SSHFS. Create a configuration. Wait, what? Oh, port, agent, username, password, private key. Okay, okay, so that's what I need to do. I need to create a configuration. Connect as workspace folder. Call this configuration. Mendel Coral, right? Or just Mendel? What? Oh, is it create configuration? I have to create a configuration. I got you.
Unnamed. Name of the configuration. Okay. Oh, you're voting for fragberg 2comy James, I don't know of another resource, but oh yeah, I love that quote. That's exactly what I really like it about it. Yeah, highly, yeah, absolutely. Um, do the global settings, Jason, save. Host name or IP address of the server. Okay, what about 192. 168.10.216. Agent username. Oh, I don't want to do a prompt. I actually have this SSH based, so let's pass to a private key. Hold on. I think my key is. Oh, Doc Comey, you're right. He did mention it earlier in the chat, did he not? That's fine. That's fine. I need I need to look up my key here, so give me just a second. So now what do we do? SSH connect. So it's going to try to connect. Password. Is it going to be in plain? No, it won't. Okay, cool. Hold on. Then I got to figure out how to do the key stuff later, the SSH. Okay, I'm in. Well, that's cool. So, home. in user. All right, so if y'all remember, I've run a couple of these demos here before. Let me actually go to Hi hey, BS Calaro, how you doing? Happy Thursday to you. Yeah, so SSHFS did actually work. It's it's good for now. We can use that. Let's um, go back over to get started here. And I was going to, if you look at the run a model demo, um, yeah, I was going to try to find out where'd my terminal go? Oh yeah, it's over here. Gouda like the cheese. You, yeah, I'm good too. I am. Uh, I'm doing very well. Thank you for asking. We're here. I'm actually messing with this Google Coral board that is on my desk here. 
So getting connected to it, we actually got connected to the, to it over SSH and VS Code. So now what I was gonna do is actually try to figure out where these demos are located, because I forgot. User bin, that's where it is, okay. Yeah, okay. There we go. So there's a number of demo uh, bash files in here. Come on, there we go. The Edge PU demo. Um, and this is the one that runs Here, let's just do this. I'll show you what the demo looks like. So if I run this command against the device, So this is the this is live inference object detection in motion or object classification against these cars using the mobile net SSD. BS Claro, so um, the Google Coral board is actually Google's um, edge based machine learning board. So it is it's, it's similar to a Raspberry Pi kind of style form factor, but it has one of their Edge TPU or TensorFlow processing unit modules on it. Um, so all of this can run locally, completely disconnected from the internet, which is really cool. And you'll see sort of the demo logging streaming back behind. You binged it, awesome. It's a cool board. And notice it slowed down there for just a second. But right now, I mean, I'm getting about 70 frames per second, depending on the number of objects that are in the screen. So you can actually switch. Oh, look at this. You can run, hit the N key to switch between edge and a CPU. So we're getting about 70 to 80 frames per second on the TPU. If I hit N. Come on. Yeah, I pressed the N key. It's not picking it up. Here's Clara. Oracle was trying to, to uh, POC some of that and it failed. Oh, yeah. They were probably, you know, right idea, wrong time, right? Way too early. So that's what that demo is. The actual source for that, and this is the actual source code that runs when I just ran that. This is what's actually happening in the in the bash file. That it pulls in the mobile net test data. It pulls in a sample video file, which is just that MP4 of the car streaming across. I'll press N to switch between models on the command line. Oh, there you go. So let's do that again then. Where did I go? So if I run it now, and then I hit in. Okay, see, so now it's actually running just on the CPU. So if I was doing CPU only inference, I'm getting like two and a half frames per second. This is why we use the cloud for inference, right? But if I use the TPU instead, so I'll go back to in and switch back. Now my FPS is back up to 80. Yeah, and VS Claro, it's running, it's running TensorFlow Lite. So the models it's actually running are TensorFlow Lite models, which is what I was just about to open up and look at. Um, so the model files are under user share edge TPU demo. Yeah, it's really cool. So these are pre, so the training is actually not happening on the devices. The training is happening um, elsewhere. These models get trained and then 
they get loaded. Oh, and the fan just turned on. So it keeps on going. Quit. Okay, where did it say it was? Did you see Tesla's deep dive on their embedded neural network device at Florida? No, actually, I haven't yet. Um, do you have a link to that? I, I have been meaning to catch up on it, but I haven't seen it yet. So, okay, user share. Edge TPU demo. So yeah, so you'll see BS Caller. These are actually TF Lite models. So if I look at, um, Rhinosaurus Rex, that's awesome though. So you can train it on generic data, but on customer sensitive data, it can be processed without worrying about sending it somewhere. Abs that's absolutely right, Ryan. That's exactly right. Uh, which is really, really cool. Um, security and speed are obviously a big thing here. So not just the speed of the processor, but also not having to pipe this video data back up to the cloud and wait for it to come back down. But also, yeah, that if you're doing a demo that requires like personally identifiable information. So again, going back to what I want to build over the next couple of weeks, I want to actually do face tracking and emotion detection. The advantage of using the coral is that I can capture a picture of someone's face, run the model, run inference, and I never actually have to submit that person's face to the cloud. Like it never actually leaves the device and I'll just dump it when it's done. So it's completely secure and doesn't capture any personally identifiable information about the person beyond that. So, oh, YouTube link, cool. All right, let me, I'll save it. Thank you. Thank you, BS Clara, I appreciate that. No, 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 don't play it now. Vimeo is advertising hard up on YouTube. I feel like that's all I've been seeing lately. Um, so, I want to see what's actually happening. Decoder player. So I'm going to have to dig in the source of what's actually happening here. CocoLabels.txt. Oh, okay, so this is actually the labels file for all of these, for these that come across car, truck, I guess if a boat were to show up as well, or sheep, giraffe, that's pretty awesome. They get up to like 140 plus tops, that's, that's crazy. So there's another demo on here. So I, I just showed this one off, but there's actually another demo on here that I wanted to look at. Um, not this one specifically. So let me actually go back to getting started because there is a run a model. There's a face tracking model on here too. If I can find it. Oh yeah, the API overview and demos, here we go. Yeah. Object detection.py, so here we go. So, I want to run this object detection demo. No. But where is it? The docs here are okay, but they don't, here we go. Navigate to the directory of the demos. So this is where, let me go back in here. What was that directory? User lib Python three. Da, 
Wait, what? User. Oh, user lib, sorry. User lib, Python 3. Edge TPU, demo. So we can take a look at the source here. So this is the object detection demo is the one that I wanted to look at. So the whole idea here is that you can do either face detection or object detection. And the only thing that changes is you have the same source script here, but you either, you pass in a model file. In this case, this is the face quant model file. Uh, and then you pass in a piece of test data, which is the face. I'll show you all those in just a second. Uh, and then for object detection, you pass in a different model, the mobile net V1. And you'll notice that all these models are TF light models that have been trained elsewhere. And then you pass in a labels file for your pet detection, which has all the various pet labels and then an image of those pets. And all that stuff is in test data here. Right, so this is, um, oh no, not that one. Here's my face. I'll pull it over real quick. <laughs> I don't know who those guys are, but they're not smiling. You'd think they'd be happy that they got embedded in a demo. I'm guessing these are guys on the Google Coral team. Maybe y'all know who these are. I don't know if these are supposed to be like well-known people. I don't know who they are. Anyway, so you have face and then the actual mobile net model files here. And here's what actually happens. So let's actually walk, walk through the source here. So there's an edge TPU implementation of the TensorFlow detection engine, um, which gets pulled in. And then if your model is the, okay, this is just the arg, argument parser, it's fine. The, initial, the engine gets initialized with the arguments. Um, you read the file, open the image, and then run inference. So this is the inference piece. Ah, uh, that's nice, James Kappa. Yeah, that's funny. I don't know, I don't know. <laughs> So detect with image is the meat of what's actually happening here in this demo um, against the image. I pass in an image, I pass in a threshold of some kind, whether or not I wanna keep the aspect ratio, displaying relative coordinates from zero, zero, and then I don't know what top K means. Let's see if I can get the I can't. Um, hmm. that's okay. And then you display the result. You get an answer back from the engine. And this is actually another reason that I was hoping that the remote, uh, the, the SSH extension would work because it was going to be kind of fun to step through this line by line and debug it, but that's okay. Um, and then basically you can run this locally, right? You can run this against, um, you know, if you're just running it on a, x86 machine it just shows the image or you can process it out bs claro so they went from 200 frames per second with nvidia px2 to 2000 frames per second with their own neural network device are you serious wow that's pretty awesome so let's go ahead and run this <clears throat> and we're going to cd into the User, oh, user, lib, Python 3, this packages, edge, view, demo. Two terabytes of SRAM bandwidth, that is insane. All right, so if I run this now, it'll, it's gonna show me some results. I don't know if it, yeah, it'll output the file. Oh yeah, it does in detection results. File doesn't exist. What? Oh, I 
I think I need to I need to tweak this a little bit. Cause it's not in downloads, it's in Right? This package is demo test data. Need to step up one. <sighs> test data dot base dot jpeg. That should work. Put the output in test data as well. Uh, hold on. What is the USB accelerator? So, BS Clarter, the USB accelerator is actually a, just a USB stick that you can plug into a Raspberry Pi. So it gives you some TPU processing that you can plug into another computer, which is actually kind of cool if you think about it. Hey James, oh yeah, no problem. Have a good night. Thanks for coming and hanging out for a little bit. And yeah, I'll catch you the next couple of days in other streams for sure, man. So let me get this over here and now I'll try to run it. All right, well, I got a result, but it didn't save the file. I didn't even save the file. Oh, I know, because I just... Here, let me just... Ugh, it's, it can't save the file. Anyway, so it's actually given me a bounding box around these images, but let's actually try to... I want to try to run this locally. I'm going to try to actually run it on my machine. Because um, I saved it. See, what did I do? Coral development, yeah. All right, so I actually pulled some of the demos out of here. See if I could run some of this. Yeah, yeah, VS Cloud. That's really cool. I have, I ha I haven't used the USB stick, but I've heard, um, I heard it's pretty cool. So I should be able to run classify image. So let's try running this in the terminal. Oh, right, 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 right. So I need to actually do uh, set up a Python virtual environment. That's what I need to do first. And then we're going to do pip install edge TPU edge TPU classification engine no <clears throat> oh, maybe I can't run it locally Which that bums me out I can't run this stupid demo I mean, I can, but I want it to actually output the file. I want it to show me this thinking file. Or maybe I can do, well, you know what I'll do? Here's what I'll do. Let's just do that.
not a directory. Oh, in the, <clears throat> excuse me. Fine, 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 fine. Okay, there we go. Please check home Mendel detection results. Now, now we have it. All right. Home. It's not in there. So I'm looking at the wrong home directory. Which I don't appear to be. <clears throat> but the general idea is that it should give me a image like this with red bounding boxes around the spots that have the word faces have been detected. And that's actually what I want to do. I want to take that same idea and run it against images that are captured by the webcam. So one of the first steps for this entire project is going to be to hook a webcam up to the, to the board, take a photo, and then use that as the source to run the, to run the demo. Which is probably what I'm going to end up working on uh, on, the, on the Monday stream, definitely. Um, but in the meantime, I would love to just actually see this demo working. Because I can take this, this piece at least, I can take this face detection demo as is and just use it as is. And then we can add the emotion detection piece later, but at least we can get the bounding box piece done. And then we can add in the other aspects as we go on. Input. Right, and all I would do is just change the input, right? Output, detection results, dot JPEG. seeing it so I'm just gonna try to SCP it over So the note is, I'm gonna make some notes for myself. Um, we should be able to use the existing source and just capture an image from the webcam to use as the input. Simple enough. This can be extended to use the to use motion detection inference later. Okay. Oh. Or 
believe it's say it was. Home Mendel Detection Results. Sorry. Come on, come on, come on. Slow. It may just not be in the cards for me to actually get to see this file, but you get the idea. The result would look exactly like this since this is their can demo. This is what I would end up getting from the file when that model runs. You can see the bounding box that gets output. <clears throat> so my score of 99 on my bounding box was interesting. Oh yeah, so these are different boxes. It basically tracks four faces here. If you zoom in, these two which get a higher score and then this one is lower and then the one in the back here gets the lowest score because it's further away, but it still does a pretty decent job of creating bounding boxes for all four of those, which is pretty neat. And again, this happens if I run the demo, run the exact same demo again. This was less than a second that it went through and did that. Given the model, um, it's pretty darn fast. And again, it didn't have to send that file up, bring it back down, anything like that. So that should be pretty easy to do. The other piece, if you recall, I mentioned that I was actually gonna have these, the Argon and the Google Coral Board connected via UART. Because the Argon is gonna control the mesh network of all these other particle devices and facilitate posting data up to the particle device cloud. Um, hey, the Michael Jolly. It's hosting with 18 viewers, rating with 29. Welcome, hope y'all are having a great day. Thanks for coming. Great raid. Hey, Michael Jolly, how was that? How was your stream today? Hope you all having a good time. Hope you all had a good time. What's been going on? I have missed getting to uh, to hang out with y'all this week as I was at Microsoft Build and doing other things. Hey, Rambling Geek. Hey, Ancient Coder. And I still, honestly, the Michael Jolly, I still haven't even caught the VOD from your Sunday stream with Jen Looper, although I did see her on Monday and she had a really... She had an awesome time on your stream. So that's very cool. We love that you're doing that. We have actually started a new project today. So I am in the midst of, and I'll sort of walk through this again, but um, I'm starting a brand new project that is going to be a demo for a conference talk that I'm giving next month and then a few other times later this year, where we're actually gonna do, have particle devices setting up a mesh network interacting with an edge-based machine learning board, the Google Coral. Um, this is the Google Coral that's plugged in right here. And uh, we've been messing with that today. And the, the crux of the project, oh, let me turn that camera off. The crux of the project is there's going to be a box that sits uh, in the demo space and the demo gets activated by the particle mesh network. So if you walk past an ultrasonic distance sensor, it triggers the demo. The argon is connected to the Google Coral. When you start the demo, it actually takes a photo of you making a face, like an emotion, smile, frown, what have you. And it actually uses TensorFlow Lite on the Google Coral board to detect your face, to create a bounding box around it and your emotion. Hey, MB Dealer, thanks so much for the follow. I appreciate that, that's awesome. Thanks for, uh, for coming in and hanging out. Uh, so you're actually able to run a pre-trained model against the Google Coral Board and it's going to display the result on the monitor that's hooked up. And then it's also going to light up the buttons on the box to say, 
did I, did the coral board guess your emotion correctly or incorrectly? And you hit right or wrong and it'll make some LED, you know, make some Neo pixels here light up and do all kinds of fun things. So that's the project we're working on. It's going to be a complex project. There are lots of moving pieces. There's Python stuff that I got to write on the Google Coral board. There's firmware that has to be on all the different Argon devices. And then we're also going to build a piece of hardware. We're actually going to build a wooden box to contain the Coral board and the Argon. Um, so we're going to do all that kind of stuff. So that's great. The Michael Jolly, that's awesome. Um, it sounded like the sounded like the girls had a really good time too. So very, very cool that y'all did that. So anyway, this is the, the basics or the bones of the project. What I've been working on so far today was actually running a couple of different demos here on the coral board to do face detection. There actually is a built-in, um, there's a built-in demo here on the coral that will take an image file and create a bounding box around the image file and draw a red outline around it as your face detection. So this is the, this is the demo that gets run built with a device. So one of the things that we're gonna do is um, do that same thing, but we're gonna capture an image from the USB camera. And I'm, we'll, I'll probably end up working on that on my Monday stream. Capture an image from the camera and then run the, run the actual demo against it. So that's one of the pieces I was just demoing. The other piece is the UART connection. So we're actually gonna have, and this will be an interesting challenge, I think, um, is to actually run the, a TXRX connection between the Argon and the Google Coral so that the two can talk with one another to trigger the demo on the Coral, to capture the image and send results back to the Argon, et cetera, all that good stuff. So. That was the piece that I was actually gonna take a look at right now on the dev board is connecting to the GPIO pin. So um, in the last 10 minutes that I've got before we raid over to Mr. Robert Tables, uh, I was actually gonna do this because there is, if you look on the board, and I apologize if I'm a little bit frantic or disjointed here. On the board, there are the, this is the typical Raspberry Pi 40 GPIO pins on the top, and there are TX and RX pins on there. So that's the thing, or the next piece that I wanna do is actually set up that connection there. And the way that you can do that is you can use, similar similar to what you would do with the Raspberry Pi. Let me turn that watch camera off. Similar to what you do with the Raspberry Pi, you can use, um, what is it? Um, what is the Pi based dev and you could basically use the pathing method of accessing those GPIOs or we can use the Python periphery periphery library, um, which is which is pretty cool. So that's actually what I want to set up now. Very briefly, we're going to create a new project to do this. Um, so new window. And then ultimately, I'm gonna add, let's see, new open folder. And the folder, we're gonna call this, the, the name of this project, by the way, is uh, Emotion Mesh. So we're gonna do this in development. That's gonna be my mono repo for this. And in my Emotion Mesh folder, we're gonna add a workspace folder, sorry. into Emotion Mesh, we'll add a workspace folder here. And I'm gonna create a new folder here for the, the edge board. So this is gonna be Coral, I'm gonna have to rename it, we'll call it Coral Source for now. And I'm going to add a Python file in here that's, we're going to call it uart.py. So this is going to be the piece that um, connects to the, the particle argon via uart. So I'm now going to set up a, create a Python terminal and I'm going to run the Python virtual environment command, V-E-N-V. -E <clears throat> I 
This gives me an isolated way to install packages, very similar to using node packages or running in VM or something along those lines. So I have a virtual environment so now I can do my pip installs without, without doing all kinds of, hold on, no. Pip reinstall, what was it? Python, Python periphery. Cool. So with Python periphery now, I can do something like this, where I'm going to set up a UART connection between the Argon and Coral Devboard. So from periphery, Import GPIO. So this just this, this just gives me general GPIO access, right, to all the pins. So GPIO equals GPIO. And I gotta get my UART. So I'm gonna go to UART. So my pins are eight for TX and RX. So we're gonna go coral TX. Coral RX. So that's what TX is eight, RX is ten. Out. I'm gonna set this one TX as out. Rx is in. I'm just, I don't think this is gonna work locally, so I'm gonna SCP it over and try to run it. Maybe, <laughs> and we'll see. And then try not to use semicolons. I've been doing a little bit of Python lately and I have a hard time not doing semicolons. Coral Rx. Yep, you can install the format, okay. So using the VS Code extension, I can run directly. The UART was it give me no module named periphery. I will, so I need to do that. Everything I just did, I need to actually do physically on the board, right? Yeah. So let me install this real quick. And then what I'll do on Monday is the, so this is what we'll do for next time. Let me do that real quick. Pip3 install Python. Periphery. Cool, it's installed. So now let's take this file and let's put it somewhere here. We'll put it in user. Okay, here we go. How about home, Mendel, and motion mesh, okay. A new file, uart.py. Let's try running it and see what happens. Mission denied. Do I need an pseudo? Just 
Pseudo. Okay, so it works. No module named periphery. I do it here too. Did I spell it wrong? I didn't spell it wrong. Let's try again. Ah! It's Python errors, come on! This way, same problem. All right, well, I got some debugging to do on the Python side, but that's the general idea is that this should give me the ability to communicate with the particle argon, and on the other side, I will write firmware against the argon to actually claim that device. So that is what we're gonna do next time. Um, we are going to, let's see, we did this. We'll walk through that face detection source code. We're gonna actually physically create that connection, get it working, uh, set up an IoT Central project, and then start actually getting the, um, oh wait, what's the other piece I wanted to do next time? Let me make a note of that. Next time, finish. Finish the UART setup. Um, and then, oh yeah. Set up webcam and image capture. Run the face tracking demo on the captured image. Boom. So that's what we'll do next time. So it is four o'clock central time. I need to be done, but we're gonna raid over to Mr. Robert Tables, see what he has been up to, because I haven't gotten to be on anybody's streams this week. So Thank you all for coming and hanging out today. Um, that's all I got. We will continue again on Monday at noon with the new schedule. Like I mentioned, I will stream for three hours on Monday, starting at noon central, go to three central. And uh, it was fun. I had a good time exploring some new things, getting to share my thoughts on build. Uh, for those of y'all that came in late, um, you can check the VOD for those if you want to hear some of the IoT stuff related to build. And uh, y'all take care and we'll talk to you again soon. Bye.